Hello and welcome to this event looking at improving outcomes in cancer care. Thank you so much for giving up an hour of your lunchtime today to join us. I'm Ruth Robertson. I'm a senior fellow at the King's Fund and I'm going to be chairing the event today. And I want to start up front by thanking the sponsors for this event. The event was funded and sponsored by MSD. You'll see we've got a fantastic panel um, today, and I'm going to come to introduce them in a moment. But first, let me tell you a little bit about how the event's going to run. I know for some people, this might be the first uh, King's Fund online event that you're joining. So first to let you know the event is live. If anything goes wrong, you're going to see it play out in real time. There's no editing here. Uh, but the good part of that is that it means we, after our initial panel discussion with me posing questions to the experts, there's going to be some time at the end for a live Q&A, which is always a fantastic and interesting part of the discussion. So please do put your questions um, to the panel. You'll see on the right hand side of the video on your screen, there's a Slido box. That's where you put your questions and you can also upvote other people's questions. So if there's something you'd particularly like me to ask the panel, do add your vote to it and I'll be doing my best to get as many of the popular questions posed to our panel as possible um, in the time we have available. We're also going to be posing some poll questions um, to you. You'll see those flash up and it's going to be really interesting to see from the audience what the responses are to those questions. So take a look and take part. Um, if you're tweeters, please do tweet about the event. We have uh, a hashtag, hashtag KF online. That's KF for King's Fund online. Uh, so do use that with your tweets so other people can know about the event. They can uh, listen back on demand um, if they want to check in on the content afterwards. And the final thing is on the left hand side of the video, I hope you can see a, a menu which allows you to navigate to various things, including our resources page. So do check that out maybe after the event. There's a lot of information in there if you want to delve into these topics um, in more detail. Now, we had a look at the um, stats before we logged on, and there's 1,100 people signed up for this event today, so a really great audience, and it includes people who are directly working uh, in cancer services or connected areas, and a group of people who are just trying to increase their knowledge on these topics. So I'm really going to try my best because of that dual audience to keep the discussion as accessible as possible. I'm going to try and call people out when they use acronyms or, or, or terms that we don't understand. That I'll do my best on that um, to keep the discussion as accessible as possible. But I think that's enough uh, introduction from me. We want to get on to hear from the panel. That's who you're here uh, to listen to. So let me start by asking um, each panel member to just briefly introduce yourselves and I'm going to go around on my screen as I see it. So I'll start, Dame Kelly, please, just a couple of words of introduction from you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ruth. Uh, thanks for joining me and really good to see so many people joining the call. I'm Kelly Palmer. I have a dual role as National Cancer Director for NHS England and uh, on the ground as Chief Executive of the Royal Marsden, which is a specialist cancer centre, as many people on the call will know. So that's me. Great to have you here. Thank you, Dane Kelly. Um, David Long. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's David Long, uh, representing MSD. I lead our oncology uh, organisation. Thanks, David. Um, Professor Samreen Ahmed. Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm um, Samreen Ahmed. I'm a medical oncologist working for the University Hospitals of Leicester. I also have a role in Association of Cancer Physicians representing um, cancer positions around the country. Fantastic. Thank you, Samreen. And finally, Dr. Ian Walker. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Walker. I'm the Executive Director for Policy Information and Communications at Cancer Research UK and very much looking forward to the session today. Lovely. Thank you. So that's our panel covering a whole range of perspectives, which I think is going to make for a really rich discussion. I'm going to start by posing a few questions for the panel, um, but do start to add your questions into the Slido box. And maybe to start off with, I could turn to you, Dane Kelly, just to set the context for this discussion. You've got that national role. Could you say some words about where you think the current state of cancer services is right now and what the national priorities are in this area. 
Yeah, th thanks, Ruth. So cancer remains an absolute priority for the NHS. So we've got substantial investment going into the National Cancer Programme on things like early diagnosis initiatives and just making sure we risk stratify pathways properly and tackle inequalities. So big investment still going into cancer. Um, and actually during the pandemic, although um, we did see a drop off early on, we've recovered that. Um, there, obviously, the pandemic, there were individual team and patient difficulties, but overall cancer activity was maintained alongside COVID. And we're now working with the elective recovery team to make sure that we can effectively tackle any backlogs. So I'll, and I'll come back to that and where we're up to in a minute. But um, so it remains a priority. We know that by doing things differently and transforming the way access works for patients and pathways work for patients, we can have a big impact on saving more lives. So it's a great subject for transformation and investment. Um, now, there continues to be a lot of community and political interest in cancer. And as many people on the call will be aware, um, the, the Department of Health and Social Care is developing a major condition strategy. We are feeding into that as the national cancer team. So all the things we were doing um, will continue to be picked up in that strategy. So this is about ensuring we can prevent where possible and we can uh, di diagnose early and fast where possible to really make a difference on outcomes for people. Um, so major condition strategy, we're feeding into that um, and all the sort of key aspects of that around person-centered care, more preventative aspect of um, approaching care, and then the importance of early diagnosis in cancer in particular, um, we are contributing to that from the national cancer team. Um, so just a few other things that we, we're doing. Um, we, we have been running consistent public awareness campaigns, sometimes linked with individual charities. Um, so partnering with charities who often have very good ways and routes of getting the message out to people. And that's about um, targeting some of the cancers that are, are harder to diagnose. So we've been working with both charities and patients and carers to run a consistent set of campaigns. We also tried a new campaign, which was generic, but tackling fear. Um, so for the first, some of you may have seen the Jack in the Box campaign. And that was a, a new experiment for us in the NHS, trying to run a campaign around fear of coming forward and trying to reassure people. So um, a lot of consistent investment and work going on to um, run campaigns on public awareness to ensure a timely presentation. And we've done some sort of evidence gathering to show, show, show quite how much those are working. Um, as people on the call will also be aware, we're now seeing record referrals for cancer. So they're running and have been for around two years at up to 120% of pre-pandemic levels. That's great because it means people are coming forward. Clearly the, the, the big issue there is making sure we can diagnose and treat effectively. Um, so public awareness campaigns, high level of urgent referrals, that is all good. Um, the other sort of good piece of news before I come on to some of the challenges we are diagnosing a higher proportion of cancers earlier than ever before. Um, and that's fantastic to see. So in the latest rapid registration data, we're seeing that we're that early diagnosis rate. So the number of cancers diagnosed at stage one or stage two is shifting up. It's a shift by 1.9%, but that is really significant because this has been static for years. So we're beginning to see the impact of some of the things that many of the teams on this call will be working on in concert with NHS England. So just in, in terms of some of the challenges, um, record demand, of course, um, does mean that some patients are waiting longer than we'd like. Um, and so what we're trying to do is make sure we focus attention on how we uh, really target the biggest areas of problem. And most of the pe people waiting are waiting for a decision to treat. In other words, that front end of the pathway and that diagnostic part of the pathway is incredibly important. So we're trying to roll out sort of more productive ways to work. So teledermatology, where you can double your productivity and getting patients through effectively. Fit testing for colorectal cancer so the patients don't just sit, uh, having not had a, an early screen. So it's, it's all about making it easier for patients to access services, thinking about how those access routes work, and then risk stratifying better on those pathways so that you're using NHS resources wisely and doing the right thing for patients at the same time. So the 62-day the backlog, which is often in the media, um, I'm nearly there, Ruth. I hope I'm okay on time, but just okay. a couple of minutes. Well, one more minute. Um, so the 62-day backlog has really come down. 
So that's come down by about 15,000. So that sounds huge, but actually that's a big reduction. And the way we've done that is to work with trusts that are really facing problems. And usually it's in three different cancer types. Um, so it tends to be in lung, um, lung, colorectal and skins. So, um, and also sometimes prostate cancer. So some of the high volume cancers. And we're working with the outlying trust to find ways to support them either through investment or helping with um, support, intensive support on some of those pathways. So the backlog is reducing further to go, but the really important one is some of the interventions. So the fit testing, the telederm, the tiering of trusts, which is working with outliers. We've now got the overall waiting list and the number of people waiting 29 to 62 days. Um, uh, that, that's, that's massively reduced. So we know that's, that provides a sustainable position going forward. So we're, we're kind of moving into a, a better period, having really had the challenge of, of a large backlog. Um, and for the trusts that are in this sort of tiering mechanism where we go in with intensive support and advice and we look at their stats and we look at what they're doing and we look at how we support their clinical teams, um, they've they've reduced their backlogs by over 40 percent. I mean, they've done a fantastic jobs. So, so huge well done to them. In terms of experience of care, so I always say, you know, the technical outcome for a patient obviously is key, but so is their personal experience of care. And I'll say a couple of things. So first of all, um, we're about to see the um, the, the next uh, patient experience survey results, but the, the one for 21 that was published in 22, we perform really well. The average rating for overall experience of care is 8.92 out of a, a perfect 10 score for good, for very good. I think we need to dig beneath that and look at what the real experience is. I think sometimes patients are quite generous, so the results are good, but I think we need to understand beneath that what, what the experience is like for people going through treatment, um, and particularly where the roadblocks are for people in, in each of the pathways. Um, and as I say, the, the sort of 2022 cancer experience survey results expected soon. So my summary, Ruth, just to wrap up on my intro, summary is... We're really going in the right direction with some exciting transformation of that early diagnosis um, mission and uh, ambition. Um, more to do in tackling the, the current weights for people, but those people are now in the system and we're finding ways to get through that those pathways much more efficiently with the, with the help of, of, of all the teams around the country who are doing, by the way, a fantastic job. So I'll pause there, but thanks very much for allowing me to do a quick intro. Thank you so much, Dame Kelly. And that's just a fantastic overview of, of quite a few of the topics that I think we'll be able to delve into in a bit more detail during the session. Um, let me turn to Samreen now. You know, record levels of demand, a workforce that's really been through it over the last few years. I just want to hear a bit from you about how it feels on the front line and, and what you think the workforce needs right now to be able to deliver the kind of high quality care and to kind of meet those 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 challenges that Dane Kelly set out so clearly. So thank you for bringing me in, yes. Um, so as uh, you all know, it's a very complex pathway of getting, in, uh, getting into cancer care. Um, as Dane Kelly has already alluded to, there's been a lot of work on pathways, investment into diagnostic pathways, and that, rightly so, has totally transformed the way patients come in through a diagnosis of cancer. Now, I'm a medical oncologist, so I work in the therapy section of that pathway. And we have seen such developments in terms of treatments during early cancer, late cancers, the amount of therapy, the length of therapy has increased for every single tumor type in every type of stage. And unfortunately, the workforce and the investment hasn't caught up in that delivery area. So I'll give you an example. For example, the radiotherapy capacity is working above capacity at the moment. The radiotherapy workforce is working above capacity as much as they can. Chemotherapy delivery, um, capacity, actual physical capacity in suites is running out. But more importantly, the nurses and the other allied professionals who deliver that 
treatment. So may it be immunotherapy, chemotherapy, oral drugs, they are working at full capacity. Pharmacy who do a massive, very integral job in delivering cancer treatments are really struggling to A, train those people who are specialist pharmacists in this area, not just generic pharmacists, are really struggling. So that's what we're seeing, that it's a wonderful job that people are being diagnosed earlier and coming through the pathway. For my centre in Leicester, we've just done an evaluation over the last five years, and we have seen double the numbers hitting our cancer unit for treatment. Um, so we certainly haven't seen the delivery team double in capacity and workforce at all. So I think that's where we're struggling. Um, we're trying to make everything as efficient as possible. We're not just um, resting on our laurels and saying, well, we'll just carry on the way we're working as we've been working for the last 20 years. We've made massive changes in the way we work, but efficiency as, as much as we can in terms of efficiency and trying to change the way we work. You know, not every, um, as treatments change, not every method of the way we have been working works for that. And we have tried to adjust as much as possible. I think everybody is feeling that we are probably at a point, a turning point where we are probably working as efficiently as we can. And we don't want to compromise cancer care in any way in terms of not seeing patients frequently enough and identifying the toxicities that we're producing from the therapy and, you know, adjusting their treatment accordingly. So from the therapy end, this is what we're experiencing. Thank you so much, Samreen. And I suspect we might come on a little, more, little bit more into those workforce issues during the Q&A. But I'm so struck by that figure you shared around a doubling of um, activity of, of numbers in your trust um, and the kind of capacity challenge that brings even within the kind of innovation landscape. Um, I'm really interested to understand a bit more about inequalities in cancer services and cancer care and, and how that kind of demand is playing out in terms of people having equal access to and equal outcomes experiences of care. Um, I wonder if I could turn to you, Ian, um, and ask you to, to, to share any thoughts on, on, on what inequalities look like in cancer services? What, what, what are the issues here? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ruth. And, and I guess just with a, a few kind of opening comments as well, because I'd, li I'd like to just start with something positive, which is, I think, a recognition that, um, you know, based on groundbreaking research, um, based, based on uh, extremely hard work and commitment from NHS staff, it's important just to recognise we have seen significant trends and improvements in cancer outcomes over the last 50 years. You know, survival has has, uh, has doubled in that period across, if you look at on average, across cancer types. Um, and so there's some really positive messages that we mustn't lose sight of. Um, but I think it, it is important to come back to the fact that we know, um, despite um, all the hard work, cancer services are struggling. And from a patient perspective, um, we do know that, um, you know, the, the waiting times haven't all been hit systematically for since since 2015. And, and for patients in that system, despite the really hard work of NHS staff, this is a problem. And, and uh, you know, we, we know that inequalities fit within that. So if we if we think more specifically about inequalities, um, you know, we've looked at this, we published a, quite a bit of work over the past couple of years on health inequalities and, and cancer inequalities specifically. Um, if you look at the, the most deprived quintile of the population, so uh, the 20 percent who have the, the highest levels of socioeconomic deprivation, we know that those communities um, have higher exposure to risk factors. So they typically have higher exposure to alcohol. They're about two and a half times more likely to smoke. Um, children in that population are around twice as likely to be obese. And of course, um, obese children carry that typically through into adulthood and that risk, therefore, um, for, for much of their life. Um, we know that these populations um, have generally a lower awareness of signs and symptoms. So things like lumps and bumps and moles, they're typically half as much aware of those kind of symptoms when, you know, which should raise concern and, and, and promote people engaging with the health system and also about 20% less likely to engage in screening. So what this actually means is for that most deprived community, they have higher incidence, they present typically with later stage disease, they have a worse prognosis and they have as much as 50% higher mortality if you look at cancer on average across England. So uh, 
this is a really difficult problem, but it's a really significant and important problem as well. Um, so I think um, for us, for CR UK, I guess when we think about what needs to happen here there's, there's, there's kind of two aspects to this and um, I think you heard a little bit from from Sam Reen and Kelly about the brilliant work that's happening here and now and trying to fix the backlogs and address some of the capacity issues alongside that we really do think there is a long-term strategic intervention that's needed here and it re requires um, you know political leadership political support to think about what a long-term strategy for cancer will be so if we think about inequalities one of the key drivers there is smoking um, smoking is also going to be a key driver in terms of capacity we know cancer incidents we've heard about the doubling of volume in in, in San Reed's, um center we know cancer incidence is going to increase and if we're on the current trajectory we're going to get to half a million cases uh, a year uh, by 2040 so we have to think about the prevention agenda uh, and, and smoking is a really big part of that. So I think bold political leadership around public health uh, interventions on achieving smoke free, but also critically important from an inequalities perspective is making sure that those cessation services and the public health awards that support them are available in the places that they're most needed. Um, and we know that uh, there's been some significant cuts to public health awards over recent years, and there's only about 70% of, of local trusts who have comprehensive cessation services. So um, definitely prevention, definitely early detection diagnosis priorities we've heard about building the capacity we've got the new community diagnostic centers rolling out in the communities which is a really important way of of reaching different communities um, but we have to make sure that we've got the workforce behind that so long-term planning for workforce with the right level of experience capacity capability and critically the funding that backs that up um, over a 5 10 15 year period will absolutely be instrumental in in driving a shift in the health inequalities that we see across cancer um, i'll pause there but thank you ruth Thank you. And I'm hearing some really strong themes coming out already around workforce, early diagnosis, making the most of innovation and, and thinking really long term in, in our, our planning. Um, I wonder, Samreen, is are any of the inequalities that that um, were described there, are they obvious to you in your clinic? Or I, I don't know if, if, if it's all about patients not getting to clinic or if, if you pick up anything about that from patients in your day to day practice. So um, where I work in Leicestershire is a very diverse population. There's a, a high migrant population here. Um, there's uh, a lot of ethnic diversity as well. And I definitely, I, I we haven't looked at this specifically for our area, but I definitely get the feeling that um, what Ian said about um, socioeconomic class definitely uh, comes into factor that people don't realize the symptoms they should be reporting um, due to lack of awareness, lack of education. Uh, we also see obesity as a major, major impact in um, I treat breast cancer and there are other gynecological cancers which also are um, a big make a big impact with regards to obesity. So I think those patients who have um, lack of education about symptoms, don't have also access perhaps to the services that they should be having in terms of screening, or they wish or too scared to go into that um, arena, and also communication. So um, language is a big barrier. If your first language is not English, I think you are definitely disadvantaged by uh, expression of your symptoms, trying to navigate the complexity of trying to get an appointment um, uh, and seeing the correct person at the correct time, I think is a major issue. So I'm definitely seeing that we see more advanced cases in patients who um, uh, are from those backgrounds. And it's really difficult to know how to try and level the playing field so that everybody gets equity uh, of care and treatment um, for their cancers. Thanks, Samreen. And, and David, maybe I could turn to you now on this question of how you kind of get to see the right person at the right time and, and, and you know, how we resolve some of this variation across the country. From your position in industry, is, is there anything you would add there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's probably a couple of things in picking up on some key themes coming through. I think it's worth it's really worth taking a moment to acknowledge the advances that, that that have happened, both in terms of how we diagnose, when we diagnose, 
and also the options available. I mean, the, the, the growth has been exponential over the last 10 or 15 years, which is great on one hand because the options um, to really support um, outcomes for patients are, you know, they're, they're night and day relative to where they were. Our ability to be able to diagnose and identify has improved a lot, but equally then we are faced with this challenge of more cancer patients, more options available, similar workforce, if not slightly smaller. And then how do we start to manage those? Uh, and also that with all the, I guess, the issues that have been flagged um, on this in terms of the inequity that probably was inherent, um, you add those things in, you almost make that gap even bigger. So so I think we'll, we, we've learned a lot. And I, I think the one thing that's really reassured, reassures me and reassures I think us when we work a lot with the NHS is the amount of best practice that happens is remarkable. The amount of fantastic work that's going on at the community level um, you know, at that the, at the local level um, is amazing, and I think the, these are are really committed groups and teams addressing local issues. And I think if there's a way we can better understand how to more fast more faster share how things are working, what the impacts are, are, I think we'll be able to really accelerate how we start to address some of the inequities that are within the system. I think the other piece in this, which I guess we're getting more and more insights on, is data. Um, and it's a, such a big topic data. It's very broad and complex. But I think the better we understand challenges with data, the better we can quantify them, the better we can actually measure the interventions that have, a, have an outcome and actually then prioritize to do more of that rather than starting more different initiatives uh, to try and address things as well. So I think there's, there's a few themes in there, but I, I definitely wanted to acknowledge what we definitely see are fantastic efforts and some good practice or some very good practice and the question for me is then how can we maybe share that faster across the different systems um within within nhs thanks david so a really critical question there about about spread um let me just finish up on inequalities by coming to you dame Callie. just for any thoughts from your national perspective about programs to address inequalities or perhaps also David's point on the, the spread of innovation? Yes, thank, thank you. Um, so we know that level of social deprivation is, a, is the, one of the most significant determinants in someone's outcome. So I think we have to work completely differently. And there are three or four programs in the National um, Cancer Strategy. Um, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you one example because it's the biggest one at the moment, but there are a range of others which I can comment on later. And it's the Targeted Lung Health Checks programme. It's just been in the media as going to be rolled out nationally. We've got 43 sites. And why it's different is that we, we are targeting areas where people have had problem with smoking cessation and areas of high lung cancer mortality across the country. So it's a much more targeted outreach programme. And not only is it targeted in the right areas for the right reasons, but it's also making it easier for people to come forward. So it's it's mobile, low-dose CT scans in trucks, in supermarket car parks or football stadia. It's trying to take services out into the community. Clearly, the community diagnostic centres are getting rolled out, but this is very targeted at the moment on lung. So in the right areas of the country saying, you know, please come forward, have a low-dose CT scan, come and talk to someone on smoking cessation, um, and then we'll stream you, depending on, sorry, horrible words, but we'll, we'll work out what you need and how we best support you i.e. which pathway in NHS terms, depending on what your level of risk is. And if I just tell you in the in the sites that we've rolled out so far, so lung cancer, very poor survival in this country, very late diagnosis, really high volume. And we were picking up less than 20% of patients at stage one or stage two of cancer before this, this, this scheme started. And now we're picking up 76% at stage one, stage two. And the importance of that, as clinicians on the call will know, is there are so many more curative options available. We can cure rather than manage advanced disease. Um, so things like outreach programs of this kind, we're doing another one in the, in the for, for the BRCA uh, mutation Jewish community. We're doing another one on liver surveillance. I won't go into those as well, Ruth, because on, on grounds of time at this point, but it's working completely differently to recognize speed and ease of access and which, populate, which populations or segments of the population need a particular model rather than the, the, the old sort of conventional NHS model. Um, and the lung thing has been such a good experience, I think, most importantly for patients, um, but for us in being able to, to, to really turn the tanker around. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. And it's really good to hear some of those kind of specific examples of, of programmes targeted on particular communities or, or, or types of cancer. Um, I want to reassure everyone watching that I'm going to come to audience questions shortly. I can see there are loads coming in, which is fantastic, and lots of votes for your most popular choices. Um, I'm just going to allow myself one more question to the panel before I turn to um, the audience's input. And I want to just talk a little bit more about innovation and, and how we really develop these integrated pathways um, for cancer care that, that kind of connect all the dots and make the most of all this fantastic innovation that's that's happening, builds on the progress with early diagnosis, links it with early treatment. Um, David, it, any insights from you about how how, how we get there? Uh, I'll do my best. It's a it's a tough question to answer, isn't it? Um, you solve the problem for us. Yeah, I'll do it, do it in five <laughs> minutes. Um, Look, ultimately, I think we've got about approximately 50 collaborative um, programs going with, with the NHS at the moment across a number of different uh, tumours, um, trying to really, first and foremost, figure out the pathway because they're complex and they're different and they are different by tumour and they're different by locality, depending on the setup. So I think the first piece is trying to trying to unpick a bit of the complexity that does exist sometimes. Um, I think some of the big findings or some of the big... Um, I guess learnings we've seen through many of these programs are um, it's it's probably not a a kind of complicated message to hear, but the headspace and capacity for um, colleagues within the system is is the one thing that I think if we can create a bit more headspace and a bit more capacity for cross functional teams, cross uh, pathway teams to come together, um, they generally find ways to solve challenges quite quickly. Um, and these often aren't rocket science. These aren't sort of huge, big, massive AI driven um, processes. They're often quite simple. Um, but and I think it comes back to the workforce point as well as just creating a little bit of time for, for that group to come together to really map out what is our pathway? What are our challenges? Which data do we have to help us understand that? And sometimes some of the solutions can be quite quick, quite simple, quite straightforward. Um, so I think we've tried to focus a lot on then how do we impact the here and now? knowing that more innovation will come, knowing that there's a lot already in the system, but really trying to create opportunities for these, these colleagues to come together and, and make some decisions about how they want to move things going forward. So, so I think that mental capacity within the workforce is really important for them to have the space to do this because they know what they're doing. They just don't really have the time always to get together and figure out what they want to do. So, so that's probably a big learning. So it's not sort of super in, innovative in that way, but it's critically important in terms of the work that we've done and what we've seen and being a major determinant of the made able to make quite quick and very impactful pathway improvements that ultimately are already impacting patients. Thank you so much, David. Ian, let me turn to you. Anything to add here about the role? I know your organisation is, is involved in commissioning research, uh, looking at innovations. Uh, anything you'd add from that perspective? Yeah, so, so look, I mean, I agree with, with what's been said. And, and I guess what I would start with is is just to add my excitement as well about lung uh, targeted lung health checks, because I think they are game changing. And um, it's a really great example of how innovation can come in many different ways. So it can absolutely come from scientific research that finds new biomarkers and new things that we can test for in blood for early detection, you know, multi-cancer tests that we're we're evaluating at the minute it can absolutely think about other signs and signals uh, you know biological signals that help us not just find cancer early but help us decide which of those cancers need aggressive treatment and which of those cancers are actually broadly okay to watch and wait and and less kind of uh, intensive intervention so you know it's clear to me that um, innovation is going to be critical in terms of how the health system evolves for future needs um, but that innovation is broad and it can be scientific it can be technological or it can actually be operational and actually some of the real benefits you, you've heard from Callie thinking about how the system evolves to the current needs and works better with what it's got uh, and that is also going to be a really critical part of how the system evolves um, I mean I would I would echo some of David's comments as well I think you know one of the challenges um, for research and innovation within the context of NHS's capacity and when the system is so stretched right now um, it's very difficult for people to engage 
in research. And of course, we have to engage in the research for the longer term benefit. But the trade off is how do we do that under such um, current pressures? And, you know, we've we've done um, some some research looking um, uh, with, with staff in the NHS and about two thirds of people will cite capacity um, um, and, de- you know, lack of dedicated time for research has been a real barrier. So, you know, as we move forward and we think about workforce planning, it has to include and incorporate capacity for research and research really needs to be you know a a dedicated part of people's time within the NHS because without the innovation without the research um you know we're constantly pushing uh, pushing things upwards uh, up the hill so um so I think absolutely echo those comments um and and I'll leave it there but thank you Ruth thank you Ian and Dame Kelly anything you would add in, in in response to those points yeah, well, two, two, two things to say, really, about connecting the dots, dots and spreading innovation. The, the first is that we've got a great infrastructure with 21 cancer alliances across the country, which are can be the focus for trialling the gallery tests, so the multi-cancer early detection tests, trialling the lung health checks. We have a system with a cancer focus and cancer expertise. So um, it's how we continue to optimise the role of the alliances. They regularly hold share and learn sessions. Um, I have a regular session with, with the National Cancer Team just to say, is, is anyone doing anything that's had a really great impact locally? And one recent one was, oh, we've got a breast pain pathway that's working really well. Let's share that elsewhere. So having a cancer alliance structure, it's, it's working out how we further optimise the role and function of those alliances um, to share best practice and get things off the ground faster. The second thing is, particularly sitting where I do at the Marsden, which is a very research active trust, as Ian knows, um, innovation is incredibly important in cancer. We've got fantastic cancer research in this country. We need the capacity and the space to do that work, as Ian was saying. Um, And in the National Cancer Programme, we have have allocated funding for innovation. So it's not bench research, but it's innovations which are ready to come into NHS use quickly. And we're trialling a number of different things we could make a big that we think might make a big difference to patients quickly. So innovation very important, cancer alliance is very important. Thank you, Dame Kelly. And just as a final input before I move to questions, Samreen, is is there anything you'd like to add? I mean, just I think everyone said it. Um, the can the pathway for a cancer patient transformed totally transformed from when I started um, as a consultant about 15 years ago. Um, We have multiple lines of therapies for, for instance, lung cancer, which is one of my specialities. And we had one line of therapy when I started. Um, So the the, the whole cancer space has changed so much that it's, you know, I, no matter how much we might have tried to try and keep up with the pace we haven't done. The thing I would just like to add, Ruth, if I may, is just to bring the standard of the whole country up to where we feel it should be best serving our patients. Because of these massive changes, I think the clinicians are really finding it difficult to keep up to date to best standard practice. And as associations, um, for instance, the Association of Cancer Physicians, which I'm integrally um, part of, uh, we have lots of education programs, the British Thoracic Oncology Group for lung cancer, because there's been so much innovation. We do a, a piece almost on a monthly basis for updates. People don't have time to go to conferences anymore because of the pressures that they're under. And you'll be obsolete as a, um, as a cancer physician if you do not go to a conference in the year, because by next year, everything's changed. So I think it is trying to keep all our workforce up to date and up to best standard of care practice so we can have the same equity of care for all our patients everywhere. Thank you so much. Well said, Samreen. Um, I'm now going to turn to the questions that um, you, the audience, have been putting in for the panel. Um, and I'm going to start with, with, with the two top ones that I can see there, actually, a kind of a fact-checking question um, oh, it's just switched what the top one is. I'm going to start with two questions. What, and I think they're both for Dane Kelly. Um, one is around whether um, the increase in early cancer diagnosis is being seen for all cancers, um, or is that for specific cancers only? Um, I don't know, Dane Kelly, if you if you have that kind of information at your um, fingertips. 
Um, and then there's also a question in there that I wonder if you could touch on and others may want to come in around the workforce challenges. Um, I, I'm not going to expect you to say anything about the NHS workforce plan that we're waiting for, um, but, but maybe you can share some thoughts about, about how those challenges uh, might be met through, through um, national planning. Yes, if I take the early diagnosis rates one first, this is rapid registration data. So um, that, that's that, that's where the 1.9% the, the I mentioned at the top of the call comes from. Um, and we think probably the main impact is uh, those lung health checks I've mentioned. So, But we know we need to ship. It is broader than that. I can't give you an explicit breakdown without checking my checking my facts, which I don't have in front of me. But we think probably the lung health checks have made quite a big shift because we've also seen a shift in access for, for people from, a, you know, who, who are more socially deprived. So we think that's all connected. The fact remains, though, to meet our aim to, that 75 percent of cancers are diagnosed early when we can have more impact in terms of positive outcomes for patients. We need to improve across all cancers. So my strategy isn't not mine, sorry, the NHS strategy, the one I'm supporting. It, 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 it is very importantly about all cancers, including some of the less common and rarer cancers. We've got to shift the dial on of them to really get to that 75%. So just by way of reassurance, it, it, we are looking to, to make that, that shift across all cancers. On workforce challenges, um, the National Cancer Board, which includes input from the from cancer charities and um, what was Health Education England now moved, moved into to NHS England, we have been working on a, a cancer workforce strategy for a long time. We have had significant investment, but it needs to be long-term and significant investment. Um, and we have seven priority professions in that, which include diagnostic professions, clinical and medical oncology, clinical nurse specialists in terms of training places, and also a different approach to um, skilling people up. So having chemo support workers, for example, so that you can, you can use your specialist nurses in the best possible way. So it's, it's changing the way we, we work. So we are working with Health Education England on, on the workforce strategy, both investment and priority areas. So just, just sort of, um, that's, that, that is uh, very, very important to make these things happen sustainably over time. In the meantime, uh, we're, what we're also doing is just trying to make sure, as I've said in some of my examples, that we're working more productively so rather than everyone sitting on a pathway with a low conversion rate to cancer, waiting for a decision whether they have cancer or not, you know, it's the it's the fit screening. So people don't just, just sit on that pathway for prostate cancer. It's making sure patients have a, an MP MRI before, because we've seen that, that about a third of patients then don't need to go to full biopsy. Uh, they might have other conditions or they might go back to their GP. But so, so quite a lot of what we're doing is not only targeting in terms of inequalities and difficulties in accessing services, but also targeting in terms of productivity. Um, and there are a number of initiatives like that. So I think both go hand in hand. How can we be more productive with our precious workforce? And what do we need in terms of investment and long term planning? So we have a, a proper pipeline um, and we know we can carry on delivering improvements. Thank you, Dane Kelly. I want to move on to, there's a lot, we could keep going on that, but there's a lot of topics coming up in the questions and I want to get through as many as we can. There's a couple I can see here about the voluntary and com community and social enterprise sector, such a critical part of, of the kind of care that's provided um, to patients and their families of, of, for cancer. Um, I wonder, Ian, if I could turn to you and, and ask about uh, any of your thoughts on how we have effective partnership working with um, what's known as the VCSE um, and, 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 and using those partnerships to make sure it's a, a really truly holistic uh, service that's provided for patients? Yeah, well, so, so look, I think in, in terms of um, service provision, then Kelly's probably better equipped to answer that one than I am. But but what I can add is that, um, you know, CRUK primarily as a research organisation, we absolutely do partner with the health system from a research perspective. So whether that's um, combined investments in novel clinical trials, which, of course, for cancer patients can certainly cancer patients who are late in their uh, disease progression uh, can be the, the kind of uh, only treatment option for many patients uh, we we collaborate um, in terms of information pro provision 
And indeed, uh, you know, we reference cross reference between NHS England uh, and uh, CI UK on some of the cancer information. And indeed, we've we've collaborated and helped in terms of health information programs. So we try and coordinate um, our activities uh, when pushing key health messages. Um, but but fair to say, CI UK itself doesn't um, actively support service provision. Um, although you're quite right, there is a, an important role for the sector to play in that, but but probably not one for me to comment further on. Well, that sounds like I should come back to Dane Kelly then for any reflections from you about uh, working with the, that kind of critical VCSE sector. Yeah, thank you. I think delivering improvements in cancer genuinely are part of a whole community effort. And increasingly, we're trying to approach things as a group of partners, and that includes that sector. Um, we've, we've been doing... Um, new things with charities as well. So we did um, a campaign with Prostate Cancer UK, which actually the NHS funded. They fronted, we did it together to try and do risk checker for, for men. And it was phenomenal in terms of raising public awareness. So that's charity rather than um, sort of the wider voluntary sector. But I think this is a big transformation agenda with a huge win if we get it right. So I think uh, I'm aware that our cancer alliances have um, a lot of volunteer support on individual programs and advising and feeding in at cancer alliance level. So the alliances are translating the money and the direction of travel and policy we set into local delivery that's, that, that works for their local communities. And so many of the alliances um, uh, work with volunteers and, and charities, and we do, we do centrally as well. So it's very, really important. I think you know key thing is this is a partnership effort. Um, and everyone has a role to play. We have a brilliant, by the way, we have a brilliant patient and carer group, which is very active, which advises the National Cancer Programme and tells us what it's really like, because most of those people have been through an experience themselves and they're drawn from different sectors. They have completely different sets of experiences, different ethnicities, um, and different, different cancer types that they've experienced. So, and they're really helpful. Each National Cancer Board, we look at one of the stories from them. Lovely. Thank you. I want to actually probe a little bit more now on patient experience. And there's a question um, that's been submitted around how inequalities uh, look through a patient experience lens. And I just wondered, Samreen, in your comments, you, you know, you mentioned difficulties with things like translators. Um, we've talked about inequalities in getting into the service, but, but how does it feel from your perspective, from a patient experience um, perspective? I mean, I would like to think that we are offering exactly the same high level standard um, care for all our patients. But sadly, the truth of the matter is that if I cannot get a translator for a clinical trial, for instance, to be able to explain to somebody who doesn't have their first language as English, it's exceedingly difficult for me to then trying to explain other parts of the treatment to that patient. Um, so I think they do miss out, people who don't uh, speak English miss out on um, clinical trial participation. But also just, I think the, the engagement, I suppose, with the support system that they have, they find it difficult to navigate. So, for instance, we have an emergency line number for any patient to have any specific emergency things, but we also have um, specialist nurses who support cancer patients outside that remit as well. And I suppose navigating those two differences is quite complex. They may not understand who to go to. And then, again, you know, as much as we like to keep the primary care clinicians involved in all their cancer aspect of cancer care, I think that, again, becomes difficult because they can't get into the primary care uh, system to be able to engage um, with that. So I think in all aspects, it becomes tricky, though we endeavour to try and provide the same level of standard care for everybody. I'm sure there are differences. And um, I suspect your patient experience surveys also don't go to those patients who you know, choose not to answer because their um, first language, for instance, is not English, or they, their educational needs are such that they're not able to uh, engage in um, patient surveys. 
Thank you so much. And such an important point there about whose voices we hear. And I'm thinking back to David's earlier points about data and, and really trying to understand the issues. I wonder, Samarine, if I could just um, continue on, on inequalities with you. A, an interesting question here around whether targeting the majority is the best way to make the biggest difference um, or whether that really risks missing uh, uh, some of the people we've been, been talking about because um, it feels like in the context we're in at the moment, the huge demand, the backlog, um, there's a kind of almost innate desire to just get those numbers down. Um, have you got any reflections on, on how you balance how you balance getting the numbers down versus thinking about, about inequalities? I think we have to target the high risk population first and foremost, because if we're failing at that, we can forget about wider screening, because um, these are the patients who present at the latest stage. And um, as Dame Kelly has already alluded to, we need to get that early stage diagnosis much better than we are doing currently in the UK. Before we even eat, so earlier diagnosis at advanced stage is important, but will have less impact than diagnosing early stage at an appropriate time, because these are the patients we can cure. Diagnosing advanced disease at an earlier time period is important because we want to be able to to give all the treatments and we want patients to be fit enough to be able to receive all the treatments that will impact their outcome. However, that makes less impact than diagnosing stage earlier stage disease. And that's really difficult to explain to patients actually, because um, the, the concept of earlier diagnosis at an earlier stage is different from earlier diagnosis of advanced stage disease. Yes, thank you. And thank you for setting that out so clearly. I'm just going to turn to a question now for perhaps David and then Ian. One of the questioners has, has, has set out the, um, uh, you know, the, the trends going forward that, um, incidents are going to have, have gone up by a third, I think by 2040. Um, how, you know, is innovation going to be able to meet the scale of this challenge? Um, David, perhaps I could come to you first. Um, I'd love to categorically say yes, um, but I think, look, I think back to the earlier discussions, we have to create space for innovation. Um, this is typically how problems get solved. Um, and I think referring back to, I guess, Sam Marine's previous comments, it's, there's so many challenges here, which one do we take first? But but I'm also thinking if, if there's ways we can try and find the right patient, and that, that sounds a bit odd, but Mass screening is great, but equally targeted lung screening, I think we've heard is highly effective in bringing forward the right patients to bring into the system to then ensure their diagnosis is done and they can get very fast onto a treatment that will benefit them. So I think we have to look to innovation. We have to look to many of the different pieces of work that are going on in terms of the different uh, ways to find and select patients with particular biomarkers or with particular risk factors that will enable maybe a, a slightly faster approach to them relative to I guess, good public awareness uh, amongst the broader population. Um, and I'm pretty hopeful on in innovation because generally we innovate through most of the challenges. Uh, if we look back even quite recently to the pandemic, the level of innovation through there was quite remarkable in terms of getting us out the other side. So so I'm quite hopeful, I'm quite optimistic, and I think there's much going on at the moment that will hopefully, you know, by the end of the decade, make how we manage uh, cancer in the UK look very, very different. Thank you, David. Ian, is there anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think this is the crux of the challenge that we have. We 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 know we've got, um, you know, a, a significant increase in the volume of cancer patients that will be coming down the pathway in the next 10, 15 years. We know that that population will probably be getting older. If you look on average across the number, we know that that population will be more complex. It will have multimorbidities. It will have other illnesses. And so it really does set the challenge to the system in terms of how it will respond. And for me, that has to be um, that has to be a long term strategic review. And part of the challenge is when everything is so pressured and under immense pressure as we are right now, it's very difficult to take a step out and think, actually, what is the long term strategic response? What's the long term strategic reform to the system? So. You know, you can start at the very beginning and say, actually, the one thing we can do in that time frame is really focus on prevention. 
because actually if we can slow down the pace of that increase, if we can reduce the number of cancers, and remember about four in 10 cancers uh, are preventable if you look in terms of risk factor association, et cetera. So actually if we can make significant inroads around tobacco smoking and uh, the ill health, which incidentally is obviously much broader than just cancer, um, impacts on cardiovascular disease, vascular disease, dementias, et cetera, um, that would have a really significant impact. Um, I think clearly we do have to innovate. Um, this is not just about a, uh, um, a continuous, endless, increasing resource. We have to think differently as we move forward about how we do um, treat people. Is it more about maintaining health as we move forward as opposed to just treating disease? Um, and, and absolutely would echo David's comments. It has to be more personalised. It has to be more based on um, you know, data, evidence, research that provides us greater insights as to which patients are at greatest risk and 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 the kind of final point i would make is um um the, the real challenge with inequalities is um, you absolutely don't want to stifle innovation by having a solution that works for everybody. But the flip side to that is innovation can in itself drive further inequalities. And we just need to be really mindful of that tension as we're kind of thinking about how the system evolves over the next 10, 15 years. Thanks so much, Ian. We're coming towards the end of the session, but I don't think the audience would forgive me unless I asked, um, snuck in the most popular question um, at the top of the list, which is perhaps a quick one for you, Dane Kelly, about what you think the impact of having a national long-term condition strategy rather than a specific cancer plan is. I wonder how you're thinking about that change in the way national planning is, is happening on um, long-term conditions. Um, and then I will come to the panel for their final remarks. Everything we've been doing in cancer in the long-term plan, so the personalization of care, the rollout of precision treatments, the early fast diagnosis, transforming the way patients can access care, I am expecting that to feature. If you, if you look at countries around the world, they're all trying to do the same thing better. Uh, it's not like we're, we're sort of an outlier in what we're trying to achieve. So I am expecting, and we are feeding in through the National Cancer Team to the major condition strategy. So this focus I'm expecting on more preventative approaches, the importance of early diagnosis in cancer, um, the importance of um, uh, secondary prevention, um, uh, so sort of preventing progression, managing risk factors differently. I'm expecting those to make it into the major condition strategy as, as we feed in the cancer strategy. So we are aligned, well, the, the, the assurance I'll give people on the call is my belief is we are aligned. In my, in my head, as long as cancer's in there as a priority with all those ambitions remaining, that's fine. You know, most people are going to live longer. They will probably will have more than one condition. And therefore, you can understand why why there's a, a sort of more holistic approach to major conditions. As long as we still have that absolute commitment to doing the things we need, we know need to happen in transforming cancer, I'm personally okay with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I think that's really helpful for the audience to hear. Now, just as we wrap up, I'm keen to finish on time. I wonder if I could ask people to just, the panel, to just sign off by sharing what they think the one thing is that will make the biggest difference to patients' experiences of cancer care, how we maintain this momentum in the face of all these systemic challenges um, that we know about and have come up today. So if I could ask for a kind of 20 to 30 second soundbite from each uh, panel member, that would be fantastic. I'm going to start with um, David, if that's okay with you, David. So short, short term, it's probably trying to help the cancer alliances prioritise what's important for their locality. And I think longer term, it's creating that headspace for innovation. Thank you. Sam Reen. Um, um, great opportunity here, really, that our patients are living longer, but I want them to live better and really um, introducing exercise, nutrition and psychological support for patients living longer with cancer. Thank you. Longer and better. Thank you. Ian. Yeah, for me, I think it's how we how we capture and exploit innovation um, effectively as we move forward and a significant component of that. Um, is, you know, political backing for cancer, prioritisation, long term strategic thinking. And, you know, ultimately, uh, that has to be backed by the right financial investment to make this work and create time for research within the NHS. Fantastic. And final word from Dame Kelly. 
words. Thanks, um, it's difficult to do it in, in sort of short. There's so much, but transforming the way people access services so it's easy to come forward without fear. Um, and um, the, 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 so it's, it's transforming that front end and continuing to roll out smarter kind of treatments for patients across the country and really a close keeping a close eye on how on the personalization of care for people so it's 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 better technical outcomes as we roll out these new precision treatments combined with a real eye and focus on the personalization of care the real person centered care thank you so much and i think a key theme i took from today was also just the importance of supporting the workforce to be able to have the headspace to innovate um, as David was talking about, and also the capacity to deliver is, is such a critical part of this journey. But I just want to say thank you so much to the panel for their input today. It's been fantastic to hear your perspectives. And thank you to the audience for all the questions that you've been inputting and, and, and your responses to the polls. Um, that's been wonderful. Um, we do really encourage you to share the link to this event because people can still register and listen back online. It will still be available to watch on demand. Um, and I'd also like to encourage anyone who's been listening today to uh, navigate to the feedback option on the menu on the left. Um, and we'll also send out a survey link shortly. We want to make these events as interesting and as useful to you as possible. Please give us feedback so we can keep uh, improving uh, and making sure they give you um, what you want and need. Um, we're just on one o'clock, so it's the perfect moment for me to just thank, again, our event sponsor, MSD, uh, thank the panel and you for taking part and uh, wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.